Okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Maddie Strom, and I am a current Policy and Programs Fellow with Committee of 70. Today, we are happy to have Judge Tamika Lane, who is a candidate for Pennsylvania Superior Court here with us today. And we have some students from Central High School who are going to be conducting an interview with her. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Judge Lane. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Thank you for uh, joining us. I really appreciate it. My name is Tom Quinn. I'm a teacher at Central High School and the sponsor of the Central Voter Registration Team, who will be interviewing you today, uh, as well as the Director of Education for uh, PA Youth Vote. Um, so I'm gonna just turn it right over to the students. Um, actually, Maddie, do we have the slides that we can pull up just to do the introduction? There we go. So we're doing a series of uh, candidate interviews for the past few election cycles to try to bring the candidates into the classroom, meet the students, see the schools, uh, and hopefully connect the issues that uh, students care about. So today, and second slide here, we have uh, we have Judge Tamika Lane, uh, Judge of the uh, Common Pleas Court, correct? Yes. Right? Currently, yes. Um, and so she's going to be interviewed by students of the Central Voter uh, Central Voter Registration Team. All right. So I'm going to turn it right over now to the students and uh, get started. Hi, I'm Dee Dee uh, from 281 at Central. Um, first, I'd just like to ask, like, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and um, why you're running for Superior Court? Sure. Um, I will start with just who I am, and then I'll talk about a little bit about my profession and low life, okay? Does that sound good, Dee Dee? Sounds uh, great. <laughs> great. So I was born and raised in West Philadelphia. You guys heard of the Fresh Prince? Are you guys too young for that? <laughs> That's right, born and raised in West Philadelphia. And it was there that I really just had a strong sense of service instilled in me by my grandmother. She would always say, it's not about you, honey, or it's not about you, child, or whatever word she chose to throw on the end of it. It was always the same, the gist was, that it wasn't about me. And she's absolutely right. Nothing that I've done in my life has been about me. It's always been in service of others. I actually was a public school teacher before. I see my dog is chiming in too. He wanted to uh, say hello. But I was a public school teacher before I was even a lawyer. I taught seventh grade social studies. And then after that, I went to law school and I did a lot of pro bono work in law school. And what pro bono means is that I was doing a lot of free legal services. And after that, I was served as a law clerk where I I drafted opinions for my judge, and I was a public defender where I was in court every day trying really serious criminal cases uh, before juries and judges for adults and juveniles who could not afford to hire an attorney. And I had tried thousands of cases there, and I was also a supervisor. I was a child advocate where I would go and advocate on behalf of abused and neglected children. I worked in the state senate where I was the Democratic Executive Director of the State Government Committee. And that's when like all these like voter um, laws came through, like this photo ID law that was like really one of the worst in the country at the time. And it really affected a lot of marginalized groups, like the elderly, black and brown people, LGBTQIA. You know, it, it, it impacted so many people, immigrants. And also this gerrymandering bill that really chopped up Pennsylvania and these districts that just didn't make sense. And that's why the Supreme Court later declared it unconstitutional. And so I've done a lot of things like that before I was a judge. And as a judge on the bench, I still hear a lot of serious felony cases. And I do jury trials and some trials where I make the decision. But I do human trafficking cases. I'm the only judge who does that. But I also do a lot of domestic violence, sexual assault, family violence cases, rapes, but all felony cases like drugs and guns, arson, burglary, I do it all. And I'm very active in the community. I still teach civics to public high school students and I'm an adjunct professor at Harcum College. And I do a lot of other programming as well, but I'll save that because it may be some of your questions, I'm not sure. Thank you. No, thank you. And wait a minute, I failed to mention, I do have a daughter. We talked about it a little bit before we went on Facebook Live, who is now officially a junior at Howard University. She just took her last one.
All right, who has our next question? Hi again, so I'm Samaya from 280. And because we live in such like a diverse city and also you deal with a lot of different types of cases, like you said, arsonry and robbery and immigrant status and human trafficking, I wanted to know how do the courts deal with like racial and gender bias? How do you address that in the court and try and like effectively maneuver that? That's what I was curious about. No, that's really a good question. And that's something that I actually, right before I jumped on here, I was on a, a, a workshop at work, but I got off to talk to you guys and I'm going to go back when I finish in which we're talking about those very things. We talk about implicit bias um, and things of that nature. So it's really good that we continue behind the scenes as judges to get educated and make sure that we check ourselves and our colleagues and make sure that we are making sure that justice is served for everyone regardless of where you're from, what you look like, who you love, um, if you're black, you know, what you look like, if you're rich, poor, whatever, everyone should be treated with that same dignity and respect. And that's how I operate my courtroom. And I want my courtroom, you guys heard the type of cases that I deal with. So I want my courtroom to be a safe space, but I want it to be a, a place where everyone feels that their voice was heard. And that's very important. Calvin, you ready? Yep. Um, I kind of have a follow-up question for that. Um, are there any specific changes would you make to ensure equality and like justice for all peoples? Like any specific changes at all? Well, I think what we're doing, and I say we, the courts, we are really making sure that we are looking internally. Um, I, I don't know if you guys are aware, there was a report that was generated about the first judicial district and uh, the issues that were going on. So we've really been trying to adjust, address that. I was appointed by Governor Wolf to this um, Commission on Crime and Delinquency, and also by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court on the County Adult Probation and Parole Advisory Committee. And that is where we're able to actually look at what's going on in the system and try to make some changes to make improvements. The last committee that I'm on that I was appointed by the Supreme Court, that actually got started because of the criminal justice reform that came out of Harrisburg and the legislation created that committee. So there are things that I'm doing on various committees that I'm on as well to try to help and improve the system and make sure that it really does treat everyone equally and that justice is served for all. Oh, that's a great way to put it. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And we didn't talk to you earlier, Calvin. We gotta come back. I didn't get the one thing about you. Okay, so thank you so much uh, for joining us today. My name is Miriam, and my question to you is, what qualifies one to be a judge beyond their law degree? I love that. I really think it's life experiences. I think if you look what I did professionally, how I tried a lot of cases when I was a public defender, um, I was a child advocate. So I've done a lot of different kind of law. I actually was an arbitrator. And I would sit in panels of three and we would decide civil cases for the first judicial district where I currently work. So I, I already, even though I wasn't a judge, I got to sit in a panel, I got to have those discussions, I got to make decisions. And also I think just living life and understanding how it works. And I think diversity is so important in hearing from various communities. And I told you guys I was from West Philly, but I didn't say where in West Philly I'm from. I'm from this place called The Bottom you know, in West Philly. So we didn't grow up with like a lot of money and things of that nature, but you know, we had a lot of love and, and a sense of community. And I think that also helped shape who I am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hi, Judge Lane. Um, sort of a follow-up question from the one that Miriam just asked. Thank you for letting us see you. <laughs> hi. Um, so I wanted to ask you, as a judge, how would you handle um, your conflicts of interest on the bench or how have you um, handled it and how would you continue to handle it? Well, as a judge, we have rules of things that we can do and what we cannot do. And if we have a conflict of interest, we have to recuse ourselves, meaning that I can't hear the case and one of my colleagues would have to hear it because we don't ever want someone to think that it wasn't fair, or that I wasn't impartial and that I came in with a bias. That's a great question. You guys are on fire. 
Thank you. Hi, Judge Lynn. Thank you. Um, so my question is, what changes do you think we need to make to our justice system? Well, I think that we need to keep working on improving the judicial system that people, because we know that there is a perception that it's not justice for all and that people are being treated fairly and we look at different statistics. So I think that we have to keep working on it to make sure that we actually live up to our promise that everyone is treated fairly and equally under the law and that justice for, is for everyone and not just certain people. And I think that that is a process that, you know, unfortunately won't happen tomorrow, but we are working on it so it can happen sooner. We can't put it off in delay. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else want to ask another question? Okay. Well, if you do, jump in. Uh, I have one more question for you. Um, I'd like to know, and I ask this, I ask all candidates this question, but why do you think it's important for young people to vote? Oh, that is an excellent, excellent question. And I think everyone's voice needs to be heard. Since my daughter was young, I've always taken her to the polls. Even when President Obama was running, I had her out canvassing and she was only eight years old. And I think it is important to be a voice in our democracy and make sure that we are heard. We can't say that we want change if we don't vote for it in our elected officials. Sometimes people only think about the presidential election every four years. They don't think about all the local elections that impact your lives now. And a lot of the issues that you know young people are concerned about, they, they start at that local level. And voting will ensure that your voice is heard and that people can talk about and work on things that you care about. It's so important. And I just recommend that as soon as you turn 18, you register to vote and you tell all of your friends. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, anyone else? Last question. I, Go ahead. I actually have a follow up question for that. Um, you previously mentioned that you were um, part of teaching civic education in high schools. Um, what role does civic education play in, um, in creating informed voters, informed youth voters? I love that because first of all, you, what I learned is that you guys wanna be change agents and sometimes people don't know how to do that. And it starts with knowing how our government operates. It, it starts with knowing the three branches of government and actually what they do. That way, when we have those local races for city council or for a mayor or for a state rep or um, anything like that, you know what they do in judges and you know why they matter. You know why judges matter because you know what we do and you know that there's a checks and a balances for each of these branches of government. So civics is just, it's, it's crucial. If, if you guys wanna be change agents, you have to first know how the government is set up to effectuate that change. Um, also another one, um, a lot of people usually vote in the general election. So can you tell people why it's so important for others to also to continue to vote um, in not just the general election, but it specifically in the primary elections? Because a primary is when you have multiple candidates usually um, on, like they're either gonna be part of the Democratic party or the Republican party. Because unfortunately the independents, they, they'll come in for the general, but not during the primary. And that is where you can decide whose philosophies best align with what you think or what you believe in. You know, like we had in that last presidential election, it was Bernie Sanders, it was Joe Biden, we had Kamala Harris, we had, you know, a slew of people to choose from. You know, then of course, throughout voting in the primary, it, it narrowed down. And the same goes for all of these other elections. When you have people running for city council, it's multiple people running for city council a lot of times. For judges, there are multiple people running for one spot. So your voice really matters and you have to figure out who is aligned with what you believe in and how you feel and who do you think is gonna best advocate for you. Thank you. Thank you, great questions. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else you'd like to say that you didn't get to, uh, didn't get asked? 
Well, I just want to say thank you so much. And I love that you guys are so proactive in, in talking to people who are running for office because it's so important that when you go into the the polling place or you have your mail-in ballot to vote that you actually know who these people are because sometimes people have no idea who they're voting for. So to be an informed voter is always the best. So I really commend you. You guys were well ahead of me when I was your age. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, they're, they're well ahead of me as well. <laughs> we even wrote an op-ed on that topic uh, last year. Um, so great. Cool. So we have a couple, uh, some information on a couple of slides at the end here to pull up. Um, about you know the information, where to find information about statewide judges. Uh, you can look on the PA Bar Association judicial ratings. Um, locally, you can find the Philadelphia Bar Association already has uh, also has uh, common pleas and municipal court judges uh, ratings and information. You can find a little more general information um, about websites and connections to all the judges on the Better Civics uh, Judicial Ed Elections Toolkit um, registration. Uh, it's already too late to register to vote for the primary, but that's the link there. But you still can vote by mail if you want to apply to vote by mail, okay? And find your polling place if you want to vote in, per in, in person. And if you want to get involved in helping other young people vote, then um, I would encourage you to, uh, to link up on the next slide here to uh, uh, PA Youth Vote, um, which is an opportunity for young people across the state uh, to connect and to reach out to their peers to get more young people to the polls. All right. Well, thank you very much again for joining us, Judge Lane, and uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.